Today we're going to be interested in studying the topology of Y, by which, um, I mean, the simplest thing you could imagine that I mean by that is just studying the cohomology of Y. And that's almost what we're going to be interested in, but something slightly different. A, a, a similar, a vector space of the same dimension, but a, a different vector space. So I'm going to explain what, what I mean by that in a second. But the, um, the first thing that I want to do is bring back one piece of structure I didn't talk that much about last time, which was this Hamiltonian torus action. So I recall that I wanted an action of a torus preserving the symplectic form, acting on both x and y compatibly. And I demanded that the fixed points for this torus action is uh, finite. Uh, maybe I didn't emphasize this last time quite enough, but if we look downstairs on x, this uh, fixed points of the torus action on x is just a single point. It's the same fixed points as for the torus action for the C star, this conical C star. So remember, we, we already had a, a existing, another C star, conical C star, which scaled everything down. And um, this, this Hamiltonian torus commutes with that one, and so they'll have the same fixed points. Upstairs on Y, the conical torus has maybe not just finally many fixed points, has a big fixed point set, but this um, torus action will just have finally many fixed points. And then I'm going to define the attracting sets for this torus action, so Y plus. So this is the set of all points in Y. Oh, sorry, one more piece of data. <laughs> this is what I meant to say. Inside this Hamiltonian torus, I'm going to choose a generic C star. Choose and fix this C star. Okay. And this choice of C star um, is actually should be thought of as part of the data. We'll see later that um, under symplectic duality, it corresponds to a choice of resolution. So with this choice of C star, I can consider attracting sets for this C star inside my torus. So the C star is chosen generically, so it's fixed point set is the same as for the full torus. And then the attracting set is just defined to be the set of points in Y such that the limit for this torus action, for this, sorry, for this C star action is, uh, exists. I mean, if, if the limit exists, it must it definitely be in this um, fixed point set YT. So that's Y plus. And, and similarly, we have X plus with the same definition. So just as an example, Recall our uh, favorite example of symplectic resolution was this cone, null potent cone of SL2 being resolved by the cotangent bundle of P1. And in this case, um, maybe I just draw the, uh, okay, I won't draw the, well, Inside here, maybe I'll draw the zero section of this P1, which is mapped down to the singular point. Now, the, um, the way that the torus action works here, it's kind of in this direction, it's attracting you down. So this is a, this C star action. I mean, in this case, this torus, the torus that acts effectively on P1 is just Hamiltonian torus is just C star. So in it, it, it's, it's sort of going down in this direction and, and up in this direction. So that the attracting set X plus is just this copy of A1 here. On the other hand, in Y plus, the attracting set is the union of this P1 and this preimage of this A1, or proper, I mean, it's the preimage of this A1, but it's the P1 and this part. And then the two fixed points are uh, here and here, of course, zero and infinity. Okay. So the blue stuff is the plus locus, the green stuff is the fixed points. In general, there's a morphism from, of course, from y plus to x plus. Okay, um, so what are we doing about this y plus? Well, we're gonna introduce one, um, so this, uh, this may be a slightly scary sounding thing, but it actually makes our life much simpler and is, is, not, is not complicated. So it's called hyperbolic stock. So what is it? It's a functor, I'll call it capital phi, and it goes from the derived category of sheaves, on, of constructible sheaves on X to the category of vector spaces. 
and it goes like this. You take a sheaf, and you don't just compute its cohomology, but you first take the shriek pullback to x plus, and then compute the cohomology along x plus. So here i is the inclusion of x plus into x. Okay, so um, I think this guy hasn't been that much, I don't know, internalized in, in the literature, but I think probably the best treatment of it comes from Nakajima's PCMI lecture notes from, from five years ago. And um, well, you can be defined in a much more general context. In our situation, the fixed point set is just finite or rather a single point. So that's why I call it sort of hyperbolic star. If the fixed point set was not just a single point, but some locus, I might call it hyperbolic um, localization or something. But here it's just a single point. And the main, the main fact is that if, um, if F is perverse, then this 5F is concentrated in a single degree. Well, which degree? I mean, um, the degree should be, um, I guess I should. The degree will be um, to D, maybe I should introduce here, 2D is the dimension, complex dimension of Y. So Y is of course even dimensional because it's symplectic and that's dimension 2D. And so D is the, the dimension. And maybe I should have said this a second ago, but the, this Y plus and X plus, they'll be half dimensional compared to X and Y. The reason is, well, it's easier to see maybe in Y plus, um, in, for, if you consider Y plus, it's a Lagrangian subvariety because the torus action preserves the symplectic form. So the positive directions for this torus action for the C star and the negative directions for the C star are paired under the symplectic form. So they each have half dimension. So Y plus is, is half dimension. And, 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 and in principle, and, sorry. And it, uh, also it's Lagrangian, but it's half dimension. So y, y plus and x plus are half dimensional of x and y. And then, um, okay. and then also we have this fact here that if you have a perverse sheaf and you apply this hyperbolic stock functor, then it's concentrated in, in this degree. Maybe I should say, mm, sorry, maybe I should say not all constructible sheaves. Sheaves constructible with, we have a preferred stratification on x, namely this stratification, maybe I'll mention it right now because we, we need to discuss in a second. So on x, uh, I mentioned this last time, but let me reiterate it. We have finitely many symplectic leaves. Oops. I call them X alpha, alpha and I, and they give us a stratification. And when I say constructible sheaves, I mean constructible with respect to this stratification. So why this hyperbolic stock? Um, well, you'll see in one second. So we're gonna consider the decomposition theorem. So we have this map from y to x, so we can take the push forward of the constant sheaf on y, shifted by 2d to make it perverse. And it's constructible with respect to this stratification by some symplectic leaves. So that's the result of collating. And it decomposes, uh, therefore, as a direct sum over alpha of the IC sheaf of these leaves or of their closures, tensor the top homology of the fiber. So here, F alpha is by inverse of a point X alpha, X little alpha, this is little X alpha point in big X alpha. Then after this, so sometimes you would take this decomposition theorem, then push forward to a point to, uh, to reach the usual, I mean, to reach a decomposition of the cohomology of Y, but we'll do something different, which is we'll take this decomposition theorem and then apply the hyperbolic localization, hyperbolic stock functor. So that's a functor. So this is a, an equation in the category of constructible sheaves on X. So I'm free to, 
apply my functor, which goes from constructible sheaves on X to vector spaces. So after I do that, um, this left-hand side will turn into the homology of this positive set. And in fact, the homology of this positive set in single degree, namely the top degree, like 2D. Actually, um, yeah, okay, let me, well, let me write 2D here in a second and then we'll abbreviate something in a second. So we get the top homology of Y plus. And here we get these IC sheaves. Um, so the good thing about doing this hyperbolic localization is it sort of gets rid of the IC sheaves. And in rather than turning them into the intersection homology of X alpha, it turns them into the top homology of this um, X alpha bar plus the tracking set inside X alpha. So here X alpha bar plus is um, just X plus intersect X alpha bar. And then this guy just is a vector space, so he just comes along for the ride. So we get this version of the decomposition. And just because everything in sight just involves top homology, it's only going to be concerned with the intersection, the irreducible components of these varieties. And I'm just going to abbreviate um, H of something as H top. So then we can just write this equation maybe more simply as h of y plus equals direct sum over alpha h of x alpha bar plus tensor h of alpha. So let's look at an example. So this maybe seems a little strange or abstract. Um, let's take the cotangent bundle of G24. So this is an example that's uh, rich enough that we see a bit of the structure. So it maps, it's a resolution of the, of the um, four by four square zero matrices. Okay, so that's my X, that's my Y. Um, what are my strata? Well, actually what's my X plus first of all? X plus is pretty straightforward. It's just such A's such that A is upper triangular. So because the, the way the, this, this torus is just acting by conjugation, so I chose this generic C star, and then the attracting sets for the generic C star would just be the upper triangle matrices. And then the various strata are as follows. There's X zero, which is just zero. There's X one, well, which is such matrices with square zero and rank one. And X two, which is, such matrices with um, square zero and rank two. Okay, so from picture our space X, like so, then we have a, a locus like so, where rank A is equal to one, and then somewhere here we have this point zero. And then what are the, um, so then we should, uh, according to this uh, equation here, we should examine, let me just write in this form, we should examine fibers and we should examine this positive, that uh, it's attracting sets in each, in each strata. So let's start with attracting sets and then we do fibers. So attracting sets are pretty straightforward. X zero plus, well, just still zero. X one plus, so it's A, upper triangular, uh, A squared is zero, rank A is one. Well, maybe if I put the bar, then it's rank A is less than one. And this variety actually has three irreducible components. So there are four by four matrices like so. There's these, all these free entries in the upper, in the upper part of the matrix but I want the rank to be um, in most one and the matrix to have square zero. And if you think about that, then there's three possibilities. You could have 
like this. Like this. More like so. So there's uh, three irreducible components there. And x2 plus, um, which is the same as x plus, uh, it has two irreducible components. Maybe I'll leave it as an exercise to figure out what those two components are. So this is two components. And actually in all three cases, the, the fibers are irreducible. Here the fiber is G24, here the fiber is P1, and here the fiber is just a point. So if we were to look at our, our equation, so it says homology, top homology of, um, Y plus, Sorry, I keep saying top homology. Maybe I'm making a big mistake. Why top homology? Sorry, I think I don't. I, maybe I'm sorry. Let me let me. Uh, uh, sorry, I think I said something a little wrong. The right hand side is correct, but the left hand side is just total homology. And I got myself confused. No, no, no. Sorry, I think it's okay. 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 This decomposition gives the homology of y plus, and I get um, so so I get homology of x zero plus top homology of x zero plus then so top homology of f zero plus top homology of x one plus tensor top homology of f one plus top homology of x two plus Tensor top homology of F2. So in this case, this is like one, one. The, I'm writing the dimensions here three, one, and two, one. It works out to six. Okay, so um, great. So that, this is, this is the, the, the main object of study will be this homology of Y plus and, this de and its decomposition here. So one reason, well, one reason to focus on this homology of y plus is because it's going to um, it's going to play a big role in the symplectic duality. But another reason is that it admits a categorification. So Joel, yeah, uh, there is a question in the Q and A. <laughs> The person asks, is it top homology of y plus or total homology? Sorry, that's why I got confused by it for a second. <laughs> Maybe I should just stop a second and straighten this out in my head. Um, first of all, homology, whenever I say homology, I mean Burrell Moore homology. I, I actually think that the top of Burrell Moore homology, I actually think that. Sorry, now, now I'm back to believing what I thought a second ago. So the, 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 I think this, this thing about the, <laughs> this fact here, that when it's perverse, then the hyperbolic stock is concentrated in a single degree, actually proves that the top homology of Y plus is the same as the total homology of Y plus. Again, Burrell Moore homology. It's always. Um, if somebody thinks I'm wrong, they could point it out, but now, now I'm sort of more convinced that it's right. For, for example, for this T star P1, um, there's no zeroth homology. This point is real more homology. It doesn't contribute anything because it can go off to anything. Okay. No, no one says I'm wrong, so I'll, I'll, I'll assume that I'm right. Okay, so this it can denote both top homology and total homology because they that was the answer to the question. Okay, so what do I mean by admits a categorification? 
So I mentioned last time that we have these um, algebras A, so this is a quantization. of x or of, or of y, actually algebra is quantizing y. Let's just stick to a single algebra, A, a quantization of x. <laughs> um, actually, A depends on a parameter which lives in H2. So maybe I'll fix a, a given one. Let me call it A sub theta. Does in H2. And then, the action of the torus on X gives us an action of the torus on A theta. And then the action of C, the choice of C star inside of here gives us a C star inside of here. So there's get a C star action on this algebra A theta. So this means we get a Z grading. Action of C star in a vector space is the same as Z grading on that vector space to get a Z grading on A theta. So in the case of um, uh, just a quick example, when, when uh, Y is the cotangent bundle of the flag variety, then this torus action is just the usual torus action on the universal enveloping algebra and this Z grading on the universal enveloping algebra. So A theta is the universal enveloping algebra of SLN modulo some central character. And the grading, well, it depends on the choice of C star, but if we choose the choice, the natural choice, which is like rho for C star, then the grading is um, just gives degree of EI's usual Chevrolet generators one, and degrees of FI's minus one. So it's that kind of grading. And then inside of A theta, we have the positive degree part. And we make the following definition. Um, we define category O or A theta is the category of finitely generated A theta modules. on which a theta plus acts locally in a polynomial. So um, this is supposed to be a generalization of the Bernstein uh, Gelfand Gelfand category O for the universe enveloping algebra of the semi-simple the algebra. And it was the insight of Braden, Licata, Proudfoot, and Webster that you should try to generalize this definition to any quantization of a symplectic resolution. So we, and the definition is pretty straightforward. We just look for those modules, finally generated modules on which the positive part acts locally no point. So the theorem of Great Mecca Dr. Webster is there's a characteristic cycle map. from the growth in the group of category O gradient theta to this realm or homology of Y plus. And Joy? Yeah. We have a question in the ah. chat. Great. Um, do you require Z graded modules in category O? Um, Um, I think, um, so the question is whether, whether the module should be also graded. Um, usually, always, that this, uh, this torus action, um, there's a, there's a, there'll be a subspace, like a kind of carton subalgebra of A theta. 
where the which is sort of responsible for the story section. And in that way, um, so that's like a what you might call a quantum moment map for the story section. In that way, you could recover the Z grading um, by looking at the generalized eigenspaces for that um, for that C star inside your algebra. So you, I think, you, no, it's not. It's not part of the definition, but usually maybe it comes kind of comes for free. That's a short answer to the question. Okay, so let me explain the definition of this characteristic cycle map. So it works like this. You have M, so that's it, and a beta module in category O. Then you shifify to uh, uh, maybe I'll call it and script the A theta module. So let me just remind what this means. So script the A theta, that's a sheaf of algebras. On Y quantizing. The coordinate ring of Y and the global sections of this sheaf of algebras is just the original algebra A theta. So there's a, a localization functor. And um, uh, sometimes this localization functor is an equivalence, sometimes not, but sometimes it's an equivalence of categories. But whether it's an equivalence of categories or not, there's always a functor. So you can produce this um, sheaf, sheaf version of it. And then you, um, um, and I mentioned, I mentioned last time that the, this quantization comes in two flavors, the formal quantization where you have an H bar parameter and uh, filtered quantization where you don't. So here I'm assuming that we're in the filtered setting. So this A theta is a filtered algebra whose associated graded is our coordinate thing. And similarly, this is a sheaf of filtered algebras whose associated graded is the structure sheaf of Y. And so this step, we need to choose a, a filtration on M. On this sheet M. And then we'll take its associated graded. And this associated grade of M with respect to this good filtration will now be a, a sheaf of, of, um, mo um, of modules, it will be a quasi coherent sheet. In fact, it'll be coherent because the algebra, because M was finally generated. So this is a coherent sheet. On Y, and it will be supported, set theoretically supported on Y plus, and supported on Y plus because I assumed that the A plus acts locally and potently. So if A plus acts locally and potently, that translates geometrically to the condition that the coherent sheaf is supported on my plus, so this is integrated, and then I take the support. This coherent sheaf. So it's a multi-stage procedure. And they prove that under some circumstances, this, this map is an isomorphism. Mm. Okay, so that's just this. So in this way, we can categorify the homology. And moreover, in, in their paper, which beautiful paper, this is from about, uh, well, appeared on the archive almost 10 years ago, maybe published four or five years ago. Um, they explain uh, essentially that, that this decomposition I mentioned above of this homology of Y plus can be seen um, algebraically using the category O. So uh, what kind of assumptions uh, you need to be an isomorphism? So for example, uh, do you still need the simply connectedness of, uh, um, of strata? No, I don't think that's necessary. Um, the problem, I think, well, I don't. Uh, there's a few, this, this, uh, 
I don't know the precise statement of what when you when you have an isomorphism, but I think it's um, I think it's almost always it's the, the conditions on like y and x are basically the ones I've mentioned above, which is to be a conical symplectic resolution. And I don't think you need the simply connectedness of strata, but what's maybe more complicated is for which theta this map is an isomorphism. So it, in general, it wouldn't be an isomorphism for all theta. But only for a certain theta and maybe a set that you don't know very explicitly, but you just know there are some theta or maybe generic theta. It's a nice mouse. Recall that theta is, is the quantization parameter. So, um, if, for example, in, the, in this classical case of universal enveloping algebra, semi simple algebra, theta is the central character. Okay, so now we're ready to move on and, and talk about symplectic duality. Um, maybe I should say, first of all, that this, I don't know, word symplectic duality and there's another word called 3D mirror symmetry. And um, some people use them differently. I'll just use them as exact synonyms. For me, symplectic duality and 3D mirror symmetry are just synonyms for each other. Um, so what does it mean? It means that there's one, symplectic resolution. And there's another symplectic resolution. And these two symplectic resolutions are very different. For example, they are of different dimension, um, maybe they're constructed in different ways, but they have um, matching properties. So two symplectic resolutions. And that's why we call them dual. Um, and, and another aspect of the dual is that if you take the dual twice, assuming that you're doing, uh, uh, usually it comes back to the thing you started with. So, so this dual is really a dual in that sense. And so this symplectic duality or 3D mirror symmetry has been observed both in, in mathematics and in physics. And in physics, it goes sort of under the name of something called S-duality for 3D n equals four uh, supersymmetric field theories. So I won't say anything more about the physics motivations. Well, maybe slightly more a little later, but basically I won't say anything more about the physics motivations. And if you have questions, you should definitely ask Yi Hao on Thursday. So he knows about that. Um, somebody asked, uh, Jan asked, when is the localization and, and, and equivalence um, in this, this localization function I mentioned here? And I mean, it's a good question and there's some theorems about when it's an equivalence, but I, I can't, first of all, I don't recall the theorems. And secondly, I don't think there's so um, any like really general, very explicit results, like exact, you know, they'll tell, the theorem tells you that usually it's an equivalence or outside of a, some collection of some maybe affine hyperplanes, it's an equivalence, but. Okay, back to symplectic duality. So, to dual symplectic resolutions that have things which match, not the same things on each side, but sort of different things which match. So, and I should also say, there's a lot of things which match, not just like uh, two things and that's it, but a long list, and I'm gonna tell you a lot now, and, and I know many more that are not one of the ones, some of them that I'll tell you about now. So many things, many things can be matched on, on both sides. Okay, and the last thing I should tell you is that, um, the um, this torus action is going to play a big role. So it's not just two symplectic like resolutions, but they should also have Hamiltonian torus actions with and um, so so we assume we have chosen a, a, a torus action and also a C star inside of that torus. And we'll also assume, and this, and with with this fixed points finite. It turns out that choosing this torus action with finitely many fixed points, this is actually equivalent, equivalent in the sense of this symplectic duality, uh, to um, choosing the resolution. 
by choosing a resolution, I mean, like if, if, if we fixed X shriek, there's many possible resolutions as I discussed a little bit in the answering session last time. So there's many possible resolutions and um, picking out which resolution we're interested in is equivalent to picking which C star action inside of this torus action. And if this finiteness of the, of the fixed point set, that's equivalent to the existence of a resolution. So if this torus action is not, if there's no torus action with finding many fixed points, there won't be a resolution on the other side and vice versa. And in fact, there's, um, even if you don't have a resolution, there's still like, a, and you don't have a, a torus action with finding many fixed points, there's still stuff you can do, um, but I'm just gonna stick with this simplest case where we have the torus action on both sides with finding many fixed points and we have resolutions on both sides. Okay, so what's, what are some data, which, what are some matching properties? Structures. So the first is that the Lie algebra of the torus that acts on Y is isomorphic to the second homology of Y sheet. With complex coefficients. Okay, so it looks a little weird, but it's just a, a, a there's a matching of these two vector spaces, the Lie algebra of the torus and this. The reason I write, write T sub C is because I'm just going to emphasize that this T sub C, um, this Lie algebra of our torus comes with a natural integral structure, namely the coate lattice of the torus. And this, uh, well, homology also, of course, comes with the integral structure. And this is not just an isomorphism of complex vector spaces, but compatible with this integral structure. Moreover, inside each of these uh, vector spaces, there's more data, which is there's a, a chamber structure. So, um, in, and in particular, we're going to pick out two cones in this. So inside here, we have the, uh, not, not inside the, integral homology, but inside the H2, the original one, we have the ample cone. And this ample cone is going to match with um, all those C, all those choices of C star inside our torus, which give the same attracting set. So let me explain this for a second. So backing up one second, we have a torus action on Y choice of C star inside of it. And this led to uh, Y plus. Let me write, um, letter, please. maybe rho, the choice of this C star in here. And then this depends on rho. So we get a, we can say that rho one is equivalent to rho two if Y plus rho one equals Y plus rho two. So two, uh, maps from two embeddings of C star into the torus are equivalent if we, they produce the exact same attracting sets. And this will be true because there's not very many choices of what these possible attracting sets can be. And we get a, a, a fan structure on, on the Lie algebra of, the, of, of, of our um, torus, well, the real Lie algebra of the torus. For example, in the case of the cotangent bundle of fact variety, this give, reproduces you the vial fan. And this part of this data, matching, matching of data is that the ample cone of, so ample cone means those line bundles, which are, which are ample. The ample cone of our, uh, but this is actually isomorphic to Picard group, by, by work of collated in this case, it's just the isomorphic to the Picard group. So those line bundles, which are ample, they'll match those C stars, which are equivalent to our fixed C star. So. so that's one, one another example of this matching. Okay, so that's, that's a matching from the, the, this vector space data. Okay, second, second piece of matching. So I mentioned we have um, the symplectic leaves on both sides and stratifications of our um, uh, of our singular varieties x 
and x shri. So we want there to be a bijection, an order reversing bijection. between this, so I here denotes the strata of X of X and I shriek, it's the strata of X shriek. And uh, moreover, so we would like that this, um, exchanges these fibers with this, um, well, not right now. So such that we exchange the top homology of the fiber over some F alpha with the top homology of the positive part, sorry, the attracting set in X alpha. Actually. And so these are just, uh, isomorphism of vector spaces, but even better, it just comes from a bijection between, uh, between irreducible components. And, and vice versa, the, the homology of the X uh, alpha attracting sets is the same as the homology of the fiber. So that here we had these fundamental decompositions I mentioned. And they will be exchanged by this duality. So the direct sum is over the exact same set and so it makes sense to match up these pieces of the decomposition and these, um, these pieces will match here and these pieces will match here. Okay, so fibers get exchanged with attracting sets. Um, okay, let, let's see an example of this right now. So the simplest example is to take the uh, cotangent bundle of projective space. I'm going to take that as my y. And the corresponding x is just the square zero rank one matrices. And my Dual guy is this resolution of C2 mod Z mod N. Okay, so in these cases, there's just uh, two strata. So let's look at how this strata work on the, on the uh, left-hand side here. So we just have X zero is just zero X1 is just matrices of rank one. And then if we look at this decomposition of the homology of the attracting set in the cotangent bundle of the projective space, well, we get the homology of X0, which is X0 is a point, so it's one dimensional, tensor the homology of the uh, fiber over that, which is the projective space, plus the homology of the x1 attracting part, tensor the homology of the fiber over that, which is the point. And um, the, the, the guy that's, so this is the, the dimensions or the number of irreducible components are one, one, one. And the only interesting guy is this x1 plus, and it has, um, n minus one irreducible components. So we, we already saw, we already saw a version of that over here. Sorry to scroll so much, but right here, this is the same x1 plus, it was four by four matrices with square zero and rank at most one. 
and had three irreducible components. So there's an obvious generalization. By the way, I didn't say it before, but these, these kinds of, these things are called orbital varieties. If you take a null point orbit closure and intersect with upper triangular matrices, and the irreducible components are studied like um, since, I don't know, the 70s or 80s, I don't know. And they're in bijection with the young tableau, I guess by Spalton's themes, maybe the name most associated with it. So in this case, there are three components and here there's N minus one components of the same flavor. Notice these numbers, like, you know, you multiply these numbers and then add these numbers. So it adds up to N. Um, and on the other hand, if we work dually with C2 mod Z mod N, Um, so then the, well, there's again two strata, the zero and everything else. Well, so everything else is in the second strata. And I mentioned before, um, so this is just point. And, it, and here we have the fiber over zero and so I mentioned before that the fiber over zero in this resolution is very pretty. It's a chain of n, n different p1s, sorry, n minus one p1s. So here we have that, that fiber. Universal zero, so it's those n minus one p1s. As I mentioned, n minus one. And in here we just have a point, and, and here the um, attracting set of, of X1, I mean, this is just the, the affine space, affine line. So, one, one. Okay, so here we, we see this exchange. This guy is matched with this guy because of this order reversing bijection. So maybe the notation is not so good because I wrote zeros and ones, but the, the bijection takes zero to one. So here are the, 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 the bijection between the strata must reverse the, reverse the order. So the bijection is not just the bijection taking zero to zero and one to one, it's the bijection switching at zero and one. And in this decomposition, this also switches the roles of fibers and attracting sets. And there, here you see this N minus one here matching this N minus one. All the rest of them are one, so it's hard to see that it's matching, but but it is. Um, okay. So there's there's like this is a very fun game to play to pick your favorite seems like your resolutions and try find the guy that looks dual in this sense. So there's a maybe. Um, Let's, let me say the third point, maybe. So I'm, I'm listing, well, back here, I was listing, make, making a list of matching structures on both sides. Then as I mentioned, I could make a very long list, but I, I'll stop after one more point. So I started by saying that the, there's this funny thing about the torus matching the H2. Then I said this thing about the order of reversing bijections of strata leading to this isomorphisms of the topologies. And the last thing I'm going to say is a categorification of number two. So there is an equivalence. Of categories between the derived category of category O for the quantization of our original guy and the derived category of category O for, I mean, I don't know why this, why this for the quantization of the dual guy. Okay, so this, this uh, categorifies two. And this equivalence is a little complicated in that it takes the form of a causal duality between graded lifts of these categories. So I'm, this would be like subject of a whole lot more lectures, but um, I won't talk too much detail about how this is supposed to work or, but it just to, just to be uh, 
give you a little bit of insight or a little bit of um, honesty. It's supposed to be a causal duality between the graded lifts of these category O's. And it should categorify the isomorphism between the homologies that we saw in number two. And again, this, this idea of searching for such things is, is due to Braden Nakata, Proudfoot Webster, and it's inspired by the results on causal duality for the classical category O due to um, uh, Berenstein, um, Balance and Ginsburg sort. Okay, so you probably, um, probably a good idea to give some examples of some things. So, well, we just saw this kind of fundamental example. Okay. And um, so, of course, this, this fundamental example generalizes in many ways. So, one way it generalizes is we can have a hypertoric variety here. So, uh, a hypertoric variety is given the data defining a hypertoric variety is the embedding of a torus of say, let's say rank K, so C star to the K embedded inside of C star to the N. And if we have that data, we use this to produce a hypertoric variety, which will end up having dimension um, two N minus K. So we, we take, remember the, we take the, cotangent bundle of this Cn, and we take the Hamiltonian reduction by this C star to K. Okay, three lines. And the dual, dual to this um, embedding of C star to the K and C star to the N, there's an embedding of C star to the N minus K inside of C star to the N. I mean, this C star to the N is like the dual torus of that one. And um, this leads to a, well, to a hypertoric variety like in the same way. It does not have the same dimension as we see. And the, like the, the fundamental example of this duality is where we have just this C star embedded diagonally in C star to the N, and that's dual to this uh, torus with the product one. So rank N minus one torus embedded system. So that's, a, that's the example which, which reproduces this. Okay, and um, so there's some beautiful combinatoric stuff, hyperplane arrangements, which are related to this, uh, the, the, the defining these hypertoric varieties related to defining these embeddings of tori. So um, Michael will talk about that in, in the question answer session tomorrow. So more details on this duality in this thing. And this is called, in terms of hyperplane arrangements, this is called Gale duality. Okay. Um, a, next, a next example is the cotangent bundle of a, of a flag variety, full flag variety is actually always dual to itself, or maybe slightly more precisely to the flag variety in the Langman's dual. And then, um, Last but not least is um, if we have here the um, quiver variety, so I explained last time the definition of a, of a Nakajima quiver variety associated to a choice of uh, quiver and two dimension vectors. I don't remember the notation as I think. Well, I don't know what I used last time precisely, but let me call it M lambda mu for the moment. Dual to this choice of, of, of curve variety will be an affine Grassmannian six. So I'd like to explain this, but I'm a little short on time for today. I don't know whether to try to sneak it in today or, or discuss it. It will definitely take more than five minutes. But I, so I'm a little unsure whether to sneak it in today or discuss it next time, start with that next time. Uh, Maybe I just pause to see if there are any questions. So if there are any questions, we'll take a few questions now. And we could do this next time, or if not, I'll go on.
Uh, I had a question. So in the the point three above, theta yeah. is the same for both sides. The theta is the same for oh, both sorry. sides. Oh, sorry, it shouldn't it shouldn't it shouldn't be. Okay. So there are okay. So this depends on a choice of theta and theta shape. Yeah. Um, but usually um, we would just take here theta and theta streak could be generic and integral. Um, yeah. Any other question? Did you comment on what you said um, about synthetic duality being 3D mirror symmetry? Well, <laughs> probably not, but I can. Uh, well, uh, um, so I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, you mean from the perspective of of, uh, of the physics, or or just in. Well, maybe from the perspective of um, of mirror symmetry in terms of like S Y Z or or uh, otherwise. I think it's not. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good question. But it's not. It's not related to that. I mean, I think from a mathematician's viewpoint, um, it's hard to see what makes this three dimensional and that two dimensional. From the physicist's viewpoint, um, the mirror symmetry has something to do with two dimensional. Uh, quantum field theories, duality of two-dimensional quantum field theories, and this synthetic duality has to do with the duality of uh, three-dimensional quantum field theories. Um, okay, and so from the, um, but from a mathematician's viewpoint, it's not clear what's like three-dimensional about this one and two-dimensional about the usual mirror symmetry. <laughs> so, it's not, so it's not a great answer. Um, but okay, well, maybe I'll just say a tiny bit more about the physics since I have not enough time to really talk about the Seffinger's Funyan slices. So uh, I'll start with that next time and I'll just say a couple of words just about this physics. So in physics, people are interested in, in this 3D um, n equals four supersymmetric field theory. And one, I don't know too much about these things, but one thing I have heard is that if you have such a theory, it produces you two, what we say algebraic varieties, two kinds of spaces. One space is called the Higgs branch. And one space is called the Coulomb branch. And one way to say what this symplectic duality is that we observe in math is it's the relationship between the Higgs branch and the Coulomb branch of a single theory. So these two are the symplectic dual pairs. But there's even a, there's a sort of another way to say what it is in physics or closely related is that you can take this three dimensional supersymmetric field theory and then a do something called S duality, whatever it means, and produce another three dimensional, another such three dimensional n equals four supersymmetric field theory. Maybe this one we call T, and this one T shriek. And maybe this guy here is going to be called uh, M H T, and this one called M C T. And this field theory. It will also have a Higgs branch, but it's the Higgs branch of this theory is the Coulomb branch of the original theory and vice versa. So another way of thinking about what this um, seems like duality is about is, is that, that it's a duality of these field theories and, and uh, and what happens? So, so the so these two guys, the Higgs branch of the first theory and the Higgs branch of the second theory, will be symplectic dual in, in the mathematical sense. And I think 
I don't know. So why is it called 3D mirror symmetry? Because it has to do with this, this duality of these 3D field theories is called 3D mirror symmetry. From a mathematician's viewpoint, there's nothing three-dimensional about it at all. <laughs> um, I think the subject, this history of the subject is like is 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 very interesting. I mean, this duality was observed by basically by originally by Braden, Lakata, Proudford, and Webster. And um, one day when Ben Webster was giving a talk at IHS, not at IHS, at IAS, sorry, when he was starting his postdoc there. Like all the postdocs had to give an introductory talk about their work, and he talked about this duality, and he had no idea that it had to do with physics at all. And um, somebody in the audience, maybe Gukha, Witten, anyway, said that, oh, this is the same as the duality which uh, physicists <laughs> have observed for like 20 years or something. And um, so that was a birth, I think, of a very uh, fruitful interaction. Um, Okay, so we'll see next time. I guess we'll stop now. So we'll see next time this. I haven't yet to define these affine Grassmannian slices, which is a bit surprising because they're my favorite guys. So I'll define these guys next time, affine Grassmannian slices, and we'll see in what way they are dual to quiver varieties. The first thing for next time, and then we'll continue. Um, um, then we'll discuss this work of Braden of. of of Braverman, Finkelberg, and Akajima about um, well constructing these symplectic duals in, in some generality. Okay, I'll stop there. Then. Any further question or remark? Okay. Don't be shy. Huh? I have a question about theta and theta dual for quantizations. <clears throat> so they okay. live in different spaces, right? So one in H2 of Y and another in H2 of Y dual. Yeah. So, so um, you mean, what's what's the relation supposed to be? Uh, it's a good question. I kind of, uh, I don't have a very good answer at the moment, so I didn't think about it recently. <laughs> I think H two of Y think, dual is the choice of one parameter subgroup. Of yeah, them, so but like I, I think in any case, it, as long as theta and as long as they're generic and integral, the the category actually doesn't depend on on their, their choice. So I'm pretty sure that that this category is independent of it as long as it's generic and integral. Um, so just like the usual category O. For for um, the semi simple Lie algebra will be independent of the central character, so the block. So usually we think of the full category of a semi simple Lie algebra and think of blocks. So this this thing is like a block of category O. So if, as long as the as long as the block is generic and integral, it doesn't depend on the central character. So there's not really um, it's not the choice of them is not important. I thought there was some relation that like H two of Y dual. Is like the choice of one parameter subgroup for X or Y. And then the one parameter subgroup for the dual is the choice of H2. And so kind of the category O contains both and they're swap. Yeah, no, no, it's true. So like the, um, yeah, that, that's true too. Uh, again, the category, but um, in some sense, the, um, the choice of this one parameter subgroup is sort of only important up to the, this cone that it lies in. So like the category O would only be sensitive to, to the choice of this of where of this cone. So I'm assuming that you're already in this sort of ample cone. So if you stay in the same cone, then the grading will be the same. So the category will be the same. I think Eugenia uh, is satisfied with the answer, maybe. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Are there question? Um, yeah, but sorry, I, I'm a bit confused. Uh, but in, this, in the case of category O, um, 
usually it only depends on the choice of central character, right? So it's actually um, T quotient by W. Oh, you mean um, rather than, than T? Yeah, rather than T, yeah. Yeah, okay, so um, technically the, yeah, so, well, is, is it, it's, it's a, there's a small subtlety, which is um, the, out, the, the, the universal space for quant, the, the parameter space of quantizations of, of X, or just a, a, as an algebra, is just, is, is, is H2 mod W, mod this nami comma vial group in general. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to speak about a quantization of this, the variety Y, so a sheaf of algebra is on the line, then that's parameterized by a choice in H2. So it's almost the same thing. So you could think, yeah. So for what I wrote here, it's probably better to think theta as this H2 of Y. Yeah, I guess there's something going on um, in the localization procedure. When you're in the unfold column, you get an abelian equivalence usually. And when you go to the other places, you only have the derived equivalence. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think of it. Yeah, I see it. Alexia Blanco, how does the value look like in the case of the resolution of the E6 singularity? <laughs> uh, so um, it's a good question. I don't usually think about this case. And in fact, it's, it's an example of, okay, um, I didn't say it because I always mess it up whenever I say it. So there's an example of symplectic, another like fundamental example of symplectic duality, which I <laughs> didn't mention, which maybe I should have, and it'll come back to answer Alexei's question, is that you can take the cotangent bundle of G mod P for any uh, semi-simple P. Well, that's a resolution of some no potent orbit closure. That's my Y. I won't bother writing what X is. That's dual um, to, a uh, resolution of a slow ray slice in um, the Lie algebra of G, or maybe in the Langlands dual Lie algebra. And um, I always mess this up because I, I don't know the combinatorics of these nilpoint point overclosures very well outside of type A. So in type A, this is very easy to see. Outside of type A, it's a lot harder to see. So Alexei's question is of this form because mm, this uh, C2 mod gamma, this is the, uh, this uh, C2 mod gamma, this is the um, uh, sub-minimal, uh, sub, sorry. It, it, this is a slow-to-way slice, but it's a slow-to-way slice um, slice in the in the Lie algebra corresponding to gamma. So in this case, it would be a slow to slice in in E six. So that would be dual um, to a cotangent bundle of a G mod P, and well, E six is simply lace, so the Langlands duality doesn't matter very much. So a, a cotangent bundle of a partial flag variety in E six. Um, and which partial flag variety? I guess it should be a um, small. I mean, yeah, the 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 which partial flag variety? I don't know, but some some cotangent one of some partial flag variety in in E six. Oh, except um, now that I think about it more carefully. Okay. I don't think, um, sorry, this dictionary doesn't quite, maybe, maybe I should have said this a little bit. So this dictionary works very well in type A. Outside of type A, I think the dictionary which works with, we don't always get resolutions. So I think in general, we have slow to a slices um, dual to no potent orbit closures, but not every no potent orbit closure has a resolution. 
And I, I think actually this one will be dual to one without a resolution. So maybe, maybe this answer is not very right. So a better answer would be some nil point orbital closure. And, and I guess we could probably figure out exactly which nil point orbital closure it is because this is a slow away slice to uh, sub maximal nil point orbit closure. So this will be the uh, correspond dually to the sub minimal nil point orbit closure. Maybe. Ma ma okay, so or maybe minimal. So maybe it's maybe it's dual to minimal nil point orbit closure. Yeah, okay, I, now, now, I'm, now I'm happy. This slow slice that you mentioned is dual to the minimal nil point orbit closure in E6, whatever that minimal nil point orbit closure in E6 is like. And I don't think that one admits a symplectic resolution. And my reasoning is because I mentioned before that when we don't have a Hamiltonian torus action with isolated fixed points on one side, we don't get a symplectic resolution on the other side. And if we took C2 my gamma and gamma is not Z mod N, we don't have a Hamiltonian torus action. So on the dual side, we should expect not uh, not to have a um, resolution. So I don't know what this minimal no point over closure in E6 is like, but I think it doesn't have, I think it's dual and I think it doesn't have a resolution. I think we does, can, that, uh, does that answer your question, Alexei? Yeah, Alexei was asking also for the four, but uh, maybe you can uh, reply oh. to him in the, your channel uh, or tomorrow. <laughs> well, I think the answer, the answer will be the same. It'll be, It'll okay, be a the minimal. Be the, the answer is the same. It'll be the minimal no point orbit closure of that type. So the okay, minimal no point orbit closure in D four. And I, and again, I believe it doesn't have a resolution. So I think we can thanks uh, Joel again.